this is the Provoke Prawn, and I've got a face for radio, and this is the Rogstrix X670E E Gaming E Wi Fi E, and this is the AMD Ryzen 7 7700X. And in this video, I'm going to be unboxing these things and setting them up, but also talking about the features and the highlights of this Strix motherboard. The interesting things about it, for example, it includes PCIe Gen 5 X16 slots and the ability to hold M2 NVMEs at PCIe Gen 5 as well, which is pretty interesting. It also comes with its own little heat shield, which is particularly fat specifically for those, but more on that in a minute. Now, I've set this motherboard up in a couple of different builds in the LAN Cool 3, and I'll leave all the specs of the build in the description so you can find out more and see the in-depth guide on that, as well as the setup with a 420 mm radiator that I'll show you later on, and the process for the build on that and other things. I've also done two fan setups with it, and my experience has been pretty good. This is an interesting motherboard with a number of really nice feature highlights, which, as I said, includes this fat boy heat shield, which is designed for PCIe Gen 5 M2 NVMEs, which obviously they aren't that prolific at the moment. But if you want to buy a motherboard that's going to be future proof potentially and have the ability to be upgraded in the near future, then you will be able to do that. It also has Wi Fi capabilities with Wi Fi 6E and this little nifty antenna included in the box, which is obviously pretty standard nowadays, but is a nice addition to have if you're planning on using Wi-Fi and making the most of those speeds. And other little hidden highlights include this graphics card, anti-sag bracket, which obviously you can use depending on the case that you're using. So if you don't have fans at the bottom of your case, then you do have the option of doing that. Now this is a nifty motherboard with a number of really nice features, and it's actually feature packed in various ways, both at hardware and software level, because you obviously have a lot of different software controls, and I'll talk a bit more about that later on. But there's things like AI overclocking on it, for example. But there's also some other things, a number of rear panel USB ports as well. And it is AM5 socket, which is also pleasant, because that makes life a lot easier, and I'll show you what I mean in a little while, but you'll see there's HDMI and DisplayPort connections on the rear. We've got three USB-C connections. You've got BIOS flashback and clear CMOS buttons. On the other side is intriguing because you have just four SATA ports for hard disk drives and SSDs. So there's not much in that storage, but you do have four ports for NVMe SSDs. So you do have a lot of flexibility in the storage you're going to be installing. And it's very capable in those ways as well, because you do get some pretty fast speeds out of it. And here you can see some of the setup I'm going to be using, although actually I'm going to be using Crucial RAM rather than Corsair, but that's a different story. And here you can see a little look at the manual, because I think it's worth highlighting the fact that, as I said, it has Gen 5 PCIe X16 slots on it. But it's also worth having a look at this manual and reading it because depending what you're installing, you may impact the PCIe lanes on the X16 slots if you're using multiple M2 drives. So that's worth keeping in mind there. So out of the box, obviously, we have a few things to do, including a lovely bit of peel off of the various different positions. But you'll see we have a lot of different heat shield in, on here as well for the M2 spots down the bottom. And they are removable individually rather than coming off in one big lump, which is pretty nice. And a quick close up look at some of the aspects that I really like. So we have AM5 socket. We've got a nice heat shield on the top M2, which obviously take away some of that. You've got Republic of Gamers logos all over the place. But one of the little highlights of this is it actually has three USB ports on the bottom. So you've got three internal USB headers. There are also multiple RGB connectors as well. So you can see on the top right and the bottom left, we have both 12 volt and five volt RGB headers. So perfect for connecting to RGB fans and other things. Now this motherboard also supports a DDR5 RAM. And I'm using Crucial Kit here, and I'll leave the specs in the description as well as links to find out more about all these things. And this is 32 gigs in a dual channel format. Obviously, you can put up to four sticks in there, and it will support up to 128 gigabytes in dual channel, as well as using AMD's Expo overclocking technology, which is an alternative to Intel's XMP. 
So you have settings for that. But as I mentioned earlier on, you also have overclocking for the CPU as well. So there are AI optimized overclocking settings. Now, one of the interesting build things here is obviously this is an AM5 motherboard, so a slight socket change here, and the back plate isn't removable. So worth bearing that in mind if you're going to be using a certain cooler. It's worth keeping in mind the cooler setup. So if you need a bracket on the back for your all-in-one cooler, for example, or CPU cooler, then that process might be slightly different. Maybe that cooler won't work. It's worth checking with the manufacturer. And you can see the sum of the setup process here for Corsair's H170i Elite Caplix. So you have to remove the standard clips that are held in place here. Uh, as the motherboard comes out of the box, it's just a couple of screws to remove and then a couple of plastic clips that come off. And this is actually very similar to Intel's logic. I've built a lot of Intel motherboard builds over the last few years. And usually you'd have a back plate that pushes into the rear and then you use these standoffs that screw into those. And it's worth keeping in mind actually that these standoffs are fatter on one side than they are on the other. And I actually had a problem there because I didn't notice that initially. So pay attention if you do go through that process. And then obviously the AMD A7700X processor. This is not top of the range. I purchased it myself because I wanted to obviously test this out. And this thing that runs quite hot, let me tell you, but it's actually known for doing that. If you check out the reviews online, you'll find that it does ramp up to like 95 degrees C and it does it on purpose as well. So don't panic if you do find your temps getting quite high. I'll talk a bit more about that later on. But it also has a pretty straightforward installation process. The pins are on the motherboard now rather than on the CPU. You'll see some gold arrows in the corners to let you know where you need to put this to install it. And the process for this was fairly straightforward. Just remove that, that pin, lift up the housing, and then very carefully position the CPU into there. You'll see there's a gold marking in the top left here where that arrow will line up with, and then you push that in place. You just need to be very careful not to bend the pins when you're going through this install process. Interesting design to the CPU top as well. Obviously, we've got those sort of ridges on it, which could be an issue when applying thermal paste, unless you're using pre-applied thermal paste. Just be careful not to use too much where it might run over the edges of that into the sides because that could be a problem and a bit of a mess. Not ideal. One of the weird quirks of this design. Now I want to show some of the M2 NVMe logic because you have multiple different ports on here which are capable of different speeds so that m2 slot at the top for example which is hidden behind this small heat shield is pca gen 5 compatible so if you have a gen 5 drive then you can obviously install it in there and get the most out of it but there are other multiple drive ports hidden under these other various heat shields so you'll see this one here for example that you can remove and get access to and weirdly that is actually port 4 so it's worth bearing that in mind that is m2 four and then under the bottom one you have access to another couple of drive ports three and two so the order of these is a bit odd but it's also worth bearing in mind and i'll talk about why in a second now i'm using a wd black sn 850 drive as a top drive on this system this is a gen 4 drive unfortunately i don't have any pcie gen 5 drives at the moment to be able to test it out but these Sockets are obviously designed to work at maximum speed wherever possible using the maximum number of lanes. I've done a video separately on why it's worth keeping these things in mind and the impact of what adding in more drivers can mean to your system. So it's worth checking that out. Now, if you're installing these things, obviously you have these heat shields and thermal pads on either side to keep these drives running cool. This top one obviously has this quite nice looking one that sticks out a little bit and is then screwed down. You'll have noticed the Q latch, which is a little plastic latch that you can pop on top of the drive instead of having to use an M2 screw, which is pretty nice. Now, this second drive here is actually drive four, which is socket four on the motherboard. And it's worth keeping that in mind because that one is actually PCIe Gen 4 and not Gen 5. The two bottom ones are Gen 5 as well. This bottom right one though is actually the second socket on the motherboard in terms of the logic of it, despite it being further down the motherboard. That's M2 underscore 2. And this is interesting because that's a Gen 5 port. And so is this other one over here on the left hand side. And that is M2 underscore 3. So that's actually the third port 
socket, which is weird. But also, thing to bear in mind there is those two bottom ones are Gen 5. But also, if you populate those two bottom ones, especially that third port, that can actually result in a problem because the motherboard manual notes that when port 2 is enabled, as in you've put a drive in there, the PCIe X16 slots 1 and 2 will run at half the amount of lanes, so X8 and X4 respectively, which means that you're potentially halving the bandwidth of your graphics card if you populate all the drives on this motherboard. So it's worth bearing that in mind. If you're trying to make the most of it in terms of storage with multiple Gen 5 or Gen 4 drives, then you're potentially downgrading your GPU. However, I will note that I have done this in the past and I've not found a massive performance drop from simply having less lanes on those in terms of the graphical performance, but this is really something to keep in mind. Now this is AMD AM5 socket, as I've already said, and the setup logic is a little bit different. I just want to quickly show this. So this is a Corsair H170i Elite Capelix. I've done a video on separately, and the installation for this is ever so slightly different to historically, and this is one of the nice things about this setup actually, is that you replace the standard clips on the cooler pump head and then it seats down in much the same way as an Intel one would. And there are some foibles to it, and depending on how you're building, obviously, <laughs> this varies. Now, this is quite a separate niche thing to talk about, but one of the things that's interesting is I'm using a 420mm radiator here because this is going to be a hot running CPU, but also because I wanted to test this out, and in this case, so we're setting this up and the logic of it. Done things a little bit wrong in the wrong order here. This is related to the case itself and that build rather than the motherboard. But there's some things and quirks that are worth bearing in mind. So, for example, on this motherboard, you need two 8-pin power connectors in the top left of the motherboard. By installing it after I've installed the radiator, I've then blocked the access to those, so it's a little bit tricky. But I talked through this in the build guide and went into a bit more depth on it, which I just think is interesting. Now, obviously, once it's installed, you can see there are some nice accents to it. On the far left, for example, we've got a nice bit of ROG logo and we'll see some lighting on that in a minute as well. It's a really nice looking board, I think, and really well built. And also there are some nice other features to it in both terms of BIOS and hardware software settings as well that you can access in a minute. But you can see me struggling with those power cables, so just don't make that mistake. Obviously, I also use Crucial RAM in this, as you've seen earlier on. It's low profile on purpose because basically it will give me easier access to be able to install this all in one cooler. These are all things to think about when you're building a build like this, making sure everything works because actually the case requires you to have low profile RAM when installing a 420mm radiator. Some complexities to that build process, but really easy installation for AM5 now and it's much more like Intel than previous. And the AM4 setup for Corsair coolers was a bit tricky historically because it required a couple of hooks and it was a real pain. This is so much easier with this current setup now in my mind anyway, plus the end results are pretty interesting. And I'm gonna go into the cooling performance of this as well in a second. Interesting point of note is how hot the AMD 7700X runs. It's pretty toasty. But here you can see the final result of that. Now in the BIOS, there are a number of interesting things. Obviously we have AMD Expo, which is the alternative to XMP settings from Intel, basically make sure your RAM runs at maximum speed. So it's worth turning that on when you go into the BIOS. It also has resizable bar, which makes the most of your graphics card. If you've got the latest generation, it's worth turning that on as well. And you'll see there are a number of other things, including AI Tweaker, which is custom settings. And you'd also have various different AI fan controls in the software so i recommend installing armory crate and running that and making sure you can go through those processes but to test out the performance i wanted to run cinebench and a few other tests and i found that i was hitting 95 degrees even with that cooler but i was only using three fans on the front and three fans on the radiator so i did actually want to test it in another layout so this is the default setup essentially three fans on the LAN cool three and then three fans on the radiator. And obviously, as I've shown, I got up to 95 degrees on the CPU when it was under really heavy load. But I swapped out the fans with Leon Lee's SL Infinity 140 fans all round, basically, apart from on the bottom, which are 120 mils. And then I ran the same test again. I actually got 10 degrees cooler. But what's interesting about this processor is it actually does ramp up 
to 95 degrees on purpose to put it under a good load and get the better performance out of it. If you look at the reviews out there, you'll see the same sort of commentary on it. So it's actually designed to run that hot, so it's not necessarily a panic. Obviously, this is put in under an unusual amount of load anyway. You wouldn't necessarily be doing this, and bench is pretty punishing. But it was a good test to sort of see how that performance handled. So the end result of this is a pretty nice build and also a really flexible motherboard. It's a really well-designed thing with a lot of good features to it. Potentially there are some things to bear in mind with the M2s. Obviously limited in the number of SATA ports as well with only four. But you do have DDR5, you've got AM5 socket, you've got the PCIe Gen 5 X16 ports as well. So future proofing for graphics cards and for your M2 drives as well. So there's plenty of awesome things going on here. Be sure to check out the links in the description to see the other videos on this case and on the fans and more. This has been the Provoke Prawn. Thanks for watching. You've made it right to the end of the video, you brilliant legend you. If you've enjoyed it, click that subscribe button, give me a thumbs up, and drop me a comment down below if you've got any questions. If you really enjoyed it, consider joining the channel and see the benefits of doing so. Check out these other videos. You might well find them interesting or useful. And most importantly, have a great life.